Hi, everybody. I'm Roger Lanius. Um, welcome to the Ask an Expert presentation this afternoon. Uh, we're down in the Moving Beyond Earth exhibition, uh, and we came here specifically because I have pictures to show, but no artifacts to show. Um, there is, unfortunately, uh, no real artifacts from the 1947 Roswell incident. We'll talk a lot about that uh, in the next few minutes. And uh, we're recording this for posterity, so at some point in the future, you should be able to find it online as well. Um, basically, I want to set the scene for you from uh, about 1947. Uh, I mentioned UFOs and the Cold War uh, and chicanery in the desert, and, um, and all of that seems to, uh, to be appropriate for this particular talk. Um, in 1947, the United States was beginning to enter a very serious environment with the Cold War. Uh, the Soviet Union was uh, looking like a, a very dominant power in Europe. Uh, it had taken control of much of, of Eastern Europe. It looked like it was going to try to push in and take control of places like Greece and various other parts of the Balkans. Um, and, and, and there was great concern that, that we were going to be head to head with the Soviet Union uh, in a competition that could last a short or a long time, but may well end in nuclear annihilation. So there was a lot of concern about that. It's in this particular context that the UFO craze in 1947 really begins. It, it all starts really with a fellow named uh, Kenneth Arnold. The uh, picture that you see in the back here uh, is him. He was an amateur pilot. He was a businessman. And he was flying around Mount Rainier on June 24th in which, where he claims to have seen an unidentified flying object, a UFO. Now, UFOs are legitimate. Probably we've all seen UFOs, something we cannot identify that is flying off in the distance. Uh, the chances are, at some point in time, as you continue to look at this thing, you will be able to identify it. But for the moment, it's a UFO. He saw something, we think. He certainly reported it as such. He called it a flying saucer. And that set off a real craze with lots of people. Here you can see on the, on the left-hand side this magazine, Fate, which has the story of the flying disks, as, as he called them. And it kicked off a wave of UFO sightings beginning in the latter part of June of 1947 and running through the end of that particular summer. Uh, more than 300 were reported at the time, uh, and just over the 4th of July weekend, uh, of that particular year. So, so people are seeing lots of things. What they are seeing is anyone's guess. Uh, I would be willing to bet it was not extraterrestrial, whatever it was, uh, because there's just no, uh, no indication of that anywhere in any documentation that anybody can find. Um, also, uh, later in life, um, uh, Mr. Arnold's uh, story changes somewhat. Uh, here he is, a bit older, describing more what he saw, which is not a flying disc at all, but looks lo more like the, uh, 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 some sort of a bat thing that, uh, and I'm thinking of, uh, uh, of uh, boomerang or something like that, that uh, is what it looks like. But nonetheless, it set off this craze, and lots of people saw lots of things. In uh, the summer of 1947, Roswell was a, a sleepy little town in, uh, in New Mexico. Uh, it was dominated by, uh, by farming and ranching, especially ranching, in the area. Uh, there was a military base there where the 509th Composite Group was located, which was the, which was the uh, organization that had dropped the atomic bombs at the end of World War II. So it was a very famous uh, organization. Uh, and a rancher by the name of Mac Brazil uh, found something out on some of the property that he had, about 80 miles or so out of town, that uh, he couldn't quite identify. He uh, threw some of it in the back of his truck, and he drove downtown and talked to the sheriff, George Wilcox. And he says, I don't know what this stuff is. It looks kind of weird. You know, you think it has anything to do with those UFOs that people are talking about? Um, he did that on the second uh, day after, well, he did that on the 8th of July, which is just a few days after the 4th. And, um, and immediately Wilcox called the local uh, Air Force base and said, hey, we got a rancher here who found some stuff and you guys need to come take a look at it. So they did. And um, uh, Butch Blanchard commanded that particular Air Force uh, 
uh, facility, and uh, he sent Jesse Marcel, the fellow in the middle, uh, who was an intelligence officer, over to talk to the, uh, to the sheriff and to Mac Brazil and to go back out to where this site was and to pick up whatever was there. They went back out and they loaded a bunch of stuff into, into a truck. It didn't amount to a lot. It looked, uh, uh, it, it, there were some metallic things. There were some things that looked like balsa wood. There was other stuff that, uh, that was in this as well. And uh, then they brought it back to the base. Uh, eventually, this material goes to the 8th Air Force commander, uh, Roger Ramey, uh, who's up in uh, the Dallas area. And, uh, and, and there's an interesting sort of press release, maybe not a press release, more like a verbal conversation that Marcel and the local information officer had with the local newspaper in Roswell. And it ends up creating this particular stir. On the afternoon of the 8th, it says that the Roswell Army Airfield captures flying saucer on a ranch in Roswell region. And the, the, the key piece to this, now this is an afternoon newspaper uh, from the Roswell Daily Record, the intelligence office of the 509th Bombardment Group at Roswell announced at noon today that the field has come into possession of a flying saucer. Okay, well, now this sets off everybody literally around the world. Uh, as, as the media starts to, uh, to get interested in this, they publish stories, you hear radio reports, there's all kinds of activity that's a result of this. Everybody who can get there sends their, uh, sends their journalists into the area to start investigating this further. Um, all of this, within less than 24 hours, is turned off. The next day... The Roswell Dispatch, which is a morning newspaper, imagine, by the way, a city having two newspapers, especially one the size of Roswell. I mean, it's unheard of today, except maybe New York or Chicago. Uh, and, um, but the Roswell Dispatch, which is a morning newspaper, publishes big headlines, Army debunks Roswell flying disc as world simmers with excitement, and indeed they did. The officers then turn around and say that the disc is really a weather balloon. The operative quote is, Roswell bounced into the international news scene yesterday when a flying disc was reported 85 miles northwest of town and 25 miles from Corona by WW Brazil. Now that's the rancher. And until the 8th Air Force headquarters in Fort Worth announced that the disc was nothing more than a weather balloon, the entire U.S. and England seethed with curiosity over the report, and the Roswell Telephone Company was busy handling calls from every city in this country and several from across the sea. So they debunk it. Uh, within just a few hours and, and, and in this particular speculation. Um, when the afternoon paper in Roswell is published on the 9th of July, uh, they've got more information and they've now talked to General Ramey, who's up at the 8th Air Force, and, uh, and he shows them what they found. Uh, among other things, he said that the mysterious objects um, was, were a harmless high-altitude weather balloon, not a grounded flying disc. Excitement was high until Brigadier General Roger M. Ramey, commander, da-da-da-da-da, cleared up the mystery. That's pretty much the end of it uh, for the time being. They did publish some photographs. Let me show you some of those. Uh, here is um, the, um, uh, the uh, 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 intelligence officer from Roswell, uh, Major Marcel, who's looking at the stuff, and you can see it looks kind of like mylar. And there's some, some sticks and things that are down toward the bottom. Let me get my handy-dandy pointer out. And you can see these sorts of things over here, uh, and those are, are very light sort of wood, or, so it's, or, or, or it was reported as such. Let's put it that way. Um, here you can see a similar, it's taken place at the same time with, in the same building, the same chairs are in the background, and that's General Ramey looking at the same stuff. What this actually was... Uh, by everybody's account that anyone can come up with, is that it was a part of, of, of a balloon that wasn't a weather balloon at all. There, there was good reasons to keep that a secret. It was a part of a Project Mogul uh, effort. And Project Mogul was an effort by the Department of Defense, actually before this time, the War Department, uh, to, uh, to create the ability to find out if the Russians have a nuclear weapon. And so what they wanted to do was to send into the upper atmosphere and float it over toward the Soviet Union a, um, a, a sensing device that could detect sound waves 
from an atomic bomb test, trying to determine if the Russians had the bomb. Now, by the way, they would get the bomb in 1949, and it's because of this kind of capability that we found out about it pretty quickly. Um, they did a whole bunch of these tests, and they obviously deployed it then on a, uh, a real basis as well a little bit later on. There were successors to this as well in terms of efforts to figure out what the Soviet Union was up to. And, and this particular picture is actually a pretty good one. Um, there was a launch of one of these balloons on the 4th of June from 1947, went out of Alamogordo, which wasn't all that far uh, to the west of where, uh, uh, where this uh, wreckage was found. It's probable that they didn't lose the whole balloon in this particular one as it came down. Probably pieces of it dragged off, broke off, and the thing then took off and went back on its way. And it was probably weeks before uh, Brazil was able to find uh, this material out there on a part of his, uh, his uh, property. Uh, so anyway, look at, look at this thing. This is the top of the balloon. And if you go down, what you'll find periodically is sensors, more balloons, uh, various types of reflective material, and then this bottom hits up to here and goes all the way down. You see all of these balloons, uh, another big uh, set of materials here, and then more here and all the way down to the bottom. Now this stuff is a, is a, is a, a, a metallicized uh, sort of material not unlike what was seen in the photograph. That gives us a lot of reason to suggest that that's probably what these guys found. Now, the, the, there was no way that the Air Force was going to uh, announce what they were really doing here. So at some level, maybe even the UFO story served a purpose as a cover for them. But more importantly, the weather balloon story certainly served a purpose. And, uh, and that's probably what took place. There has been no end of debate about this since 1947. Um, it really didn't, it, it kind of went away near the end of the partic that particular year. There was a, an investigation of material uh, in 1948. There was a report written that's now declassified that you can read if you wish that talks about this. And then it kind of went away in the public's mind. It emerged again in the late 1970s when uh, some of the folks who were actors in that 1947 event uh, made claims that had never been made before about the possibilities of extraterrestrials, about the finding of bodies at this particular crash site, about all kinds of other things that were uh, put into the super secret um, uh, storage in the United States and, uh, and we've said nothing about since that time. But uh, that is all far after the fact. Uh, this controversy, however, and it has been churning now for many years, this controversy uh, sparked a response uh, from a, um, uh, a New Mexico member of Congress in the mid-1990s in which he charged the Air Force with a, a reinvestigation of the Roswell incident. And it produced this phone book known as the, Re the Roswell Report, Fact versus Fiction in the New Mexico Desert, complete with all the documents you could ever possibly want. Um, and it's available online, too, if you want it. But... Um, the, the argument that they made very firmly in this was that Project Mogul was, the, uh, was by all accounts that anybody can make uh, sense of uh, what the material was that was picked up uh, by, uh, by Brazil out on his farm, that, um, uh, that there was no extraterrestrial UFO of any shape, size, form, or whatever, and, uh, and that the rest of this is just kind of bogus. Uh, now, in the aftermath of the Cold War, it's okay to talk about Project Mogul, but for many, many years, that was very secret as well. So that's the story. But it continues to live on, and it has made Roswell into kind of a mecca for those who are interested in, uh, in uh, ufology. Uh, the legend lives on. Here is an artist's uh, recreation of what he thinks might have happened on the, on the crash of, a, uh, of an extraterrestrial vehicle in 1947. Completely fictional, but, uh, but an interesting uh, thing. I think I've seen this in movies. Um, and then we have our own UFO museum in, um, uh, in Roswell as well. And when you go into this museum, it's fascinating to look at. Uh, there's all kinds of things. Uh, there's even the alien autopsy stuff that, uh, that people have talked about and dioramas depicting this. Um, and then 
The city itself uh, has got a crash site, complete with bullet holes in the sign, and um, and then uh, the the uh, if you look up at the top of the lamps, uh, you will see that they are ETs. Um, so the city has kind of lived off of this at some level, uh, and uh, and and enjoys playing it for what it's worth. The uh, the folks who are true believers in uh, the uh, Earth being visited by extraterrestrials is absolutely convinced that this is a major event in the history of this, these sets of encounters and that it's been completely covered up. Um, most of the rest of the people are uh, accepting of the Air Force's Roswell report and its explanation, and I am certainly in that category as well. Thank you for listening to this edition of Ask an Expert. A companion question and answer session for this lecture may also be available. For a schedule of upcoming Ask an Expert lectures at the museum, please visit www.nasm.si.edu.